So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today. It's my privilege to be introducing Stephen Allen. We've been trying to schedule this for quite a while, and so I'm really happy that it's happening right now. Um, Stephen actually started off his uh, educational career getting a bachelor's degree in physics uh, from BYU and then went on to take a master's and PhD in biomedical engineering uh, from University of Michigan. That's been kind of a formula for success in a lot of folks' uh, careers that I've known over the years doing medical imaging physics work. Uh, but what's unique about Stephen is that um, he was very productive as an undergraduate researcher, so he published a paper in MRM the year after he did his BS degree uh, related to work that he was doing as an undergrad related to sodium imaging and uh, B1 mapping. Um, and so that, you know, for those of you that don't know, MRM is the premier specialty journal in magnetic resonance uh, imaging physics. So that's quite an accomplishment. And then, of course, University of Michigan is a fantastic place to be. And it seems like from the get-go, you started adding to your wheelhouse uh, specialization in ultrasound and histotripsy and ablation to uh, ongoing MR work. And so I think immediately, almost, you hooked up with Eli Blasalovich, who's now an associate professor in biomedical engineering here, and you guys have had kind of a successful collaboration ever since. Um, but so in addition to combining ultrasound and MR, you continue to do MR work um, related to things like contrast mechanisms and pulse sequence development, uh, which is very impressive. So now Stephen has been, uh, for the last three years, a postdoc at UVA, kind of forging his own path uh, very independently every year, finding money to support himself and writing grants. And this last year, uh, 2019, had uh, basically a windfall year, five papers, again in MRM, and um, three to five uh, seed grants uh, secured. So your CV says three, but I've heard you today say five. So, yeah, there's two. I so I'll trust somewhere in the middle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so um, I think without any further ado, you can't cover the breadth of work that you've done over the years because it is quite broad and impressive, but you'll be talking today about non-invasive uh, neurosurgeries. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate uh, how many people have come. Uh, Stephen and I have been trying to put this together for a long time. And uh, the scheduling just kind of fell together this week. And so I appreciate everybody coming on such short notice. I've uh, been able to visit here uh, with, on some collaborations a few times. And I've been very impressed with the facilities here and kind of what's being developed and the opportunities here. Uh, so it's a real privilege for me to, to be here and present on my work. And, and so thank you for your time. Uh, so I'm talking about uh, uh, a bunch of different topics together, non-invasive neurosurgeries. Uh, ultrasound and magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and the basics of my talk, I'm going to first try to make a case for uh, non-invasive surgeries and the role that image guidance can play in enhancing those surgeries and in enhancing uh, their effect on patients, uh, and in enhancing the uh, clinical outcomes in, in patients undergoing these procedures. Uh, and then I'm going to give a couple of clinical examples that will hopefully illustrate these points. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some unmet needs and future directions in this field, and particularly um, some unmet needs and future directions, um, some ways to take this work that uh, Virginia Tech, Carillion, and the FBRI, I think, are, are uniquely suited to help address. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. So first of all, non-invasive surgeries. Um, for anybody contemplating undergoing brain surgery, it makes a lot of sense to, ha to try to uh, make a progression from an open surgery to something minim minimally invasive like laparoscopic surgery, finally to something that's completely non-invasive. Um, so the idea is instead of uh, opening a craniotomy in the skull and directly accessing the brain, perhaps we can instead thread a catheter up the patient's vasculature and use that very small catheter to 
implement some therapeutic effect. And then finally, perhaps we can just eliminate any kind of device that's introduced to the patient and instead beam some sort of energy, whether it's a gamma knife um, radiation, uh, ultrasound, or light from some kind of applicator through the patient's intact body and have that kind of energy focus down and affect some surgical mechanism uh, at, at a specified point. And, and the reason why this is uh, uh, attractive, both the patients and surgeons, is the hope that by doing so, we reduce the morbidity and the costs and the length of a hospital stay um, that's associated with brain surgery. Uh, it's kind of a scary thing to undergo. And so if we can reduce the associated side effects with these procedures, then hopefully patients will have better outcomes. And we also hope that they will, uh, well, we hope that patients will have reduced morbidities, reduced costs, and um, kind of hypothesize that the treatment outcomes will also be better than direct surgeries or direct resection. So that's kind of uh, the case for non-invasive surgery, why surgeons are interested, surgeons and patients and, and uh, uh, insurers are interested in these kinds of procedures. Um, now, because these are non-invasive, uh, the surgeon cannot directly see what he or she is doing. And so they need some sort of way to uh, measure what they're doing, to identify the target that they want to treat or remove, and to, to make sure that they're doing it right. The brain is very sensitive. You don't want to make any mistakes. And so uh, surgeons rely on image guidance, usually magnetic resonance imaging, though there, there's cases where uh, surgery is conducted under ultrasound or uh, PET imaging. Um, and what I like to tell people is that image guidance equals therapy control. So the more accurate and rich the information that these imaging devices can provide uh, to the surgeon, the better the surgeon is able to control and adapt his procedure, his or her procedure, to the patient. Um, so the better the image guidance, the better the control the surgeon has over uh, the, the procedure and the patient's outcomes. So let me give you a couple clinical uh, examples. I'll start with, the, within this field, one of the more famous examples, which is a, uh, a treatment for a disease called essential tremor. Um, it's a disease that affects up to 3% of the population. Patients who are afflicted with this disease um, have these debilitating tremors. So for example, if, if I had essential tremor and I was going to drink a, a glass of water, my hand would be shaking so hard that the water would spill all over. Um, it's, this is a, a, a progressive disease, so it gets worse with time. And people who have this disease, they're sort of an invisible patient population. They're frequently embarrassed by their condition, so they socially withdraw. Um, you don't see them very often, or they hide their condition. And uh, they're at risk for depression. So this is an example of a patient with this uh, with essential tremor who's trying to draw a circular spiral. Um, and down here is trying to draw a straight line between between these two bars, and, and uh, his or her hand is, is just shaking like crazy. Um, so you can imagine if you have that disease, that would be a significant impact on your quality of life. There's no way that you could do many of the things that you'd want to do if your hands don't operate the way that you want them to. Um, so there's a lot of different treatment options for essential tremor. You can try drugs such as levodopa. Um, which often work, though the, the patient can habituate to the drugs or the drugs lose efficacy. Uh, there's side effects, and then 30% of all cases don't respond to the medication at all. Um, there's a minimally invasive procedure called DBS, deep brain stimulation, where you thread a, a probe down through the brain and you use electrical activity at the tip of the probe to disrupt the network in the brain that, that is involved with the tremor. Um, and that is actually really uh, effective. You can really reduce the patient's shaking or tremors with that procedure. Um, not all patients are comfortable with having probes in their head. Um, and occasionally, the brain can build this uh, myelin sheath around the probe, and it will eventually lose efficacy, and then you have to reinsert the probe. So there's some maintenance associated with the procedure. Um, and then there's this uh, procedure called focused ultrasound, which is non-invasive. It has a few other advantages in that it's, it's immediate, so the patient goes into the procedure and they have shaking, they come out, and uh, their, their tremors have stopped. Um, and uh, this is the procedure I'm going to talk about right now. Let me give you a schematic of how this works. 
you have this large hemispherical device with 1,024 individual acoustic transducers or acoustic emitters arranged around the subject's head. Uh, the patient is then coupled to this device through uh, this acoustic coupling water bath. Um, and then ultrasound uh, is transmitted from these transducers through the patient's skull uh, and skin. And these uh, acoustic beams then focus down and converge onto a, a spot that's about the size of a grain of rice. Um, the, that spot absorbs a lot of the acoustic vibrations and heats up. And uh, once it gets to about, um, about 55 uh, degrees, it starts really killing the neurons in that spot. So if that grain of rice is located in the right nucleus in the brain, it can disrupt the tremors um, that are, are running through the, pa the patient's brain and, and in their hands. Then, since this is a non-invasive procedure, you can imagine if you're the surgeon, you're asking, how do I make sure this thing is pointing in the right direction? How do I know it's heating up? What, uh, the parts of the brain that I want to heat up. And so this device and this whole patient are then slid into the MRI scanner, and the MRI scanner prov provides a lot of control, to, uh, provides the surgeon a lot of control over the treatment process. So let's see what image guidance can do. Um, oh yeah, there's my tagline, image guidance equals therapy control. All right, so first of all, you use imaging to identify your target. Um, surgeons look for the uh, anterior commissure, the posterior commissure, and they stereotactically measure from those two points uh, to find the target that they want, want to ablate. You can register a model of the patient's skull to the, to the patient and then to the therapy device, and you can plan how the acoustic beams are going to propagate and how they're going to be warped by the skull um, and kind of plan your treatment. Uh, you can use an MRI as a $3 million thermometer, and you can measure the heating uh, that's occurring at that spot and make sure that, uh, yes, you've reached an ablative temperature and know the um, nearby, uh, nearby, say, the uh, interior capsule uh, has not been heated and you don't have any damage, uh, hopefully, in, in, the, uh, in that section of the brain. And um, finally, after, after you... Uh, do your procedure, you can look and find some T2 enhancement at the spot that you treated. And that can be a kind of a comfort to the surgeon uh, that they can see, yes, I have ablated this spot. And so we should expect some kind of clinical outcome. Um, this procedure has had a, a lot of success. Patients have an immediate recovery. Uh, the safety profile is very good. There's only minor side effects, side effects and you don't have to do a craniotomy, which uh, neurosurgeons don't think much about craniotomies, but I think I, as a patient, I would prefer not to have one. Um, so that's a benefit to the patients. And uh, this is just uh, uh, the after of this procedure of a patient who's regained quite a bit of control over their hands. Not perfect. Everybody has a little bit of, of uh, tremor, but nonetheless, uh, a pretty good return of control. And a randomized uh, uh, controlled trial has shown that compared to a sham group, we have a durable and consistent reduction in tremor for patients who undergo this procedure. Um, so what does image guidance do? Um, it gives the surgeon a lot of control over the procedure. They can identify the target. They can plan the treatment. They can measure the actual treatment mechanism uh, through thermometry. And then they can verify their, their work afterward. Um, OK, so all of that work is work that I have not done. Other people have done all of that. So I just want to be clear that, that, uh, that uh, hopefully I've cited it properly. Um, I'm going to, in the, my next clinical example, I'm going to talk about some work that I've been involved with, um, I've been fortunate enough, lucky enough to be involved with. Um, and that's in the direction uh, that I'm trying to pivot toward, which is pediatric brain tumors. So there's about 4,300 children who are diagnosed with uh, brain tumors every year. Um, and the survival rate is, is, is OK. 60% of these uh, patients survive beyond five years, uh, which is about double of what it used to be 30 years ago. The problem is, is because they are children and because our current cancer treatments are crude, they suffer a lifelong burden associated with the treatment of their disease. Um, their major mor morbidities are, we call them, late effects. So for example, this is from a uh, it's called the St. Jude study, which uh, examined several thousands of pa pediatric uh, cancer patients. And on the vertical axis is a measure cumulative burden per individual, or the measure of how many times have the, on average, have these patients undergone a health event that disabled them or worse. So from disability all the way up to death. 
And so for a healthy control, you imagine at age 25, a small number of, of people have had this kind of event. But if you are a central nervous system brain tumor survival or survivor as a child, you can bet that you've had around three to four uh, events that have either disabled you or uh, severely disabled you or killed you. Um, so even though if you're a child you may survive your cancer, you have this lifelong burden uh, of, of poor health. And um, so it would be really nice if we could treat children in a way that they can have a healthy rest of their life, not just survive. Um, all right, so different tumor management mechanisms for children cause different late effects. So, for example, medical management such as chemotherapeutics can introduce a lot of, uh, called it cardiac toxicity, um, so their, 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 their hearts have problems as they grow up. Um, surgery and radiotherapy can cause neural deficits. The radiotherapy can cause endocrine disorders, so they have hormone imbalances for the rest of their lives. Um, I'm interested in this particular procedure called histotripsy, which is in the preclinical stage um, of, of, of treatment. And I think it has uh, a lot of advantages. In particular, it's a fast treatment. It's non-ionizing. It can be very precise. And I hypothesize, and I should have put this on here, that it's non-toxic. So hopefully it will eliminate cardiac toxicity and neural deficits and endocrine disorders and other late effects that patients can, um, that pediatric patients can experience. <coughs> All right, so what is histotripsy? Um, there's actually a researcher here named Eli Vlasaljevic at for Blacksburg who does research in this field. He and I did grad school together. Um, it is a focus ultrasound therapy. So think of it, you have the big helmet with lots of transducer emitters, but you change the parameters that define your acoustic wave such that those acoustic waves do not deposit heat at the target when they focus down. So you don't have any heating going on. But instead, the compressional and, and tensile forces, particularly the tensile forces of those acoustic waves, kind of, um, they, you can think of it as they fracture water. So for example, if you're trying to open a bag of cereal and you pull and then all of a sudden the, the bag breaks and the cornflakes go everywhere, that's kind of what's happening in, uh, in water or in tissue. You have this tensile force and something in the structure gives way and you have this explosion of these dense bubble clouds. And the forces associated with bu those bubble clouds far exceed the mechanical strength of cellular tissue. And so cells that are exposed to these bubble clouds are completely emulsified. There's no residual uh, structure that you can really observe on histology and the margins are very precise. So the hypothesis is that if we have a, a child with a brain tumor, maybe we can use this bubble cloud and we can just steer it through the tumor and it can emulsify and destroy the tumor. And if the homogenate or what's left over is non-toxic or non-harmful to the patient, and we can control where that bubble cloud occurs, uh, perhaps we can produce this a safe, a non-toxic, non-ionizing treatment for pediatric brain tumors. Yeah? So if I could ask for a second, going back to your <clears throat> sort of starting round hypothesis about the long-term effects in these kids mm -hmm. beyond just survival. Yeah. So when you look at the other modalities of you know, surgery or radiation, for example, I could just be clear in my mind relating to the histotripsy and why the, the lack of them, I guess. Um, is, is it, what's happening? Is it at the margins? Uh, subtle changes after a surgical resection, um, after radiation treatment, is it just the more general ionizing radiation effects that are imprecise with respect to where they were delivered and spread? So all these other events that are happening mm -hmm. in these kids, what, what do we know about what's causing that? Right. So with, with open surgery, um, the things you have to watch out for are that you've, you haven't resected enough of the tumor and it grows back, or you've rese resected too much and you have damaged healthy brain tissue. Um, with radiation, uh, there's a, a, a region of very high dose and then a penumbra of, of dose. And uh, since there's no image guidance simultaneous to radiation therapy, the target can perhaps be uh, off target. Yeah. Sure. Your surgeon was absolutely precise uh -huh. and got, got it all with the resection and nothing beyond it. Did, did, did you then argue all these other things wouldn't have happened? 
Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Well, you're really testing my knowledge of, okay. of brain tumor surgery. Uh, Yeah, I, th I think it will be very helpful. Now, a neurosurgeon might argue and say, look, I'm very precise when I, when I do it. Um, but but I, think, I think in terms of, uh, you know, you don't have to do a craniotomy. It's completely non-invasive, and yet you can have precise borders. I think that will be a, a significant advantage. Yeah. I would like to make a comment on the non-invasive. Yeah. I mean, while you don't cut through a head, you, cut, you, you deliver heat to mm -hmm. the head. Yeah, right, yeah, or, or a bubble cloud, that is an invasion. You passively record stuff, you don't, nothing, you don't put anything in your head, and you're eavesdropping stuff that we would get on the outside, so I would call that non -invasive. Okay. In fact, this is profoundly invasive in that it heats the tissue up. Even if you didn't burn the tissue, you'll probably turn on heat shock proteins that change that heat mm -hmm. So would you prefer highly selectively invasive? Would that be a? Yeah, it's an invasive method. I mean, it's, yeah. it is what it is. Less I mean, invasive. I can't put my five-year-old in to yeah. burn a tumor out and deliver energy. That, I can't think of anything more invasive than heating up the brain. Hmm. So, it's not your turn. No, no, no. All right. So selectively invasive procedures. We can do that. <laughs> well, well, you hit a point, right? You're right. A little mistake could lead to, yeah. And in the brain and with children, that's especially too, regardless of the treatment mechanism. Um, my hope, my hypothesis is that with improved image guidance and good engineering, we can reduce the risk that's associated with, you know, tilting the device the wrong way or, or the phase distribution on your uh, elements is wrong. Yeah. What sorts of murkiness is the ability to do accurate MR thermometry? Yeah, no, there's uh, a robust field of study. It's about <laughs> uh, plus or minus one degree off at the focus, although um, I'm going to actually get into some of the limitations of it later on in the talk. Okay. Yeah. So yes? Mm -hmm. How rapidly does uh, the surgeon that would be directing that get feedback to the brain to try and do the test? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, the thermometry has a, f uh, in the current Im implementation, the thermometry has a frame rate of about three and a half seconds. So every three and a half seconds, the surgeon is able to see an update on the temperature that the MRI plane is scanning. Um, and in the current implementation, then the surgeon has an ability to kill the, the procedure, and not to, pay, to stop the, the procedure, um, stop sonicating. Um, and there are also automatic mechanisms to automatically stop sonication if the temperature exceeds uh, a given threshold, usually about 62 degrees. Um, yeah, so. Sure. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, for thermally ablated tissue, uh, uh, the bot macrophages come in and they eat it up, and the the brain seems to kind of collapse a little bit around the point. And then with uh, non-heated but liquefied tissue, the same thing seems to happen. And depending on the stiffness of the tissue, you may end up with like this cyst or fluid-filled void. But I believe in the brain, it kind of 
smushes. So in the liver, you keep a void. Kidneys, you keep a void. But in the brain, it kind of collapses in. All right, so, um, so this histotripsy, it's non-thermal. These bubble clouds are very precise, so you can have these kind of one millimeter, you can form these like one millimeter grid points in the brain. Um, this, it's not heating, so um, you have these very sharp margins. You don't have like a spread of heat from the focal spot into the surrounding areas, or diffusion of heat. Um, it can also be electronically steerable. And, uh, and you can you know, use that bubble cloud kind of like Pac-Man, the old game, and it can kind of munch through uh, a volume. Um, again, it's, it's selectively invasive, uh, and so I believe it would require image guidance to decrease the risk of an error during a procedure. Um, so some tasks that I did as a graduate student is I said, well, Surgeons are going to want to see this bubble cloud and where it happens. So can I, we find some way to monitor cavitation? Um, and uh, can we find some way to detect our lesions? In particular, I wanted to use MRI because um, if we're going to transmit through the skull, it's more difficult to use uh, ultrasound imaging to monitor these effects. I felt na uh, magnetic resonance imaging would be a natural fit for a transcranial um, uh, treatment. So uh, what I found after some work was if this is a standard MRI pulse sequence, um, these cavitation events I model here as a delta, if time is along the horizontal axis, these bubble clouds explode and then disappear and collapse in, in less than a microsecond, or uh, not a micro, a millisecond. Um, and an MRI imaging sequence is on a much larger time scale. Um, so, so you can kind of approximate them as these like infinitesimally brief explosions. And if I bracket those uh, infinitesimally brief explosions with this bipolar uh, gradient, uh, basically this encodes whatever water motion these cavitation clouds induce in the subject is then encoded into the resulting MRI image. And in particular, if the water motion is chaotic or random or uh, not, not uh, collinear, then um, it induces a signal loss or a, a dark spot in the resulting image. Similar to, I don't know if anybody here does a diffusion MRI, but the physics are very similar. You can think of this as a, a very brief and extreme diffusion event. Uh, all right, so, so here's kind of an example from my early work. You have this, uh, this is a piece of liver, although it may not look like it. And, uh, and on the bottom here is a uh, ultrasound transducer. And the acoustic beams are propagating up into the focus. And uh, if I play this sequence and I synchronize it to these cavitation events, uh, you get this little dark spot. Uh, and that is the chaotic water flow that's induced by the cavitation event. Um, and you might think, well, well, there's a lot of things that cause dark spots. How do you know that it's cavitation? And, and the best, that we did, I did a number of experiments, but the most convincing experiment to prove that that's the case is I used what's called the passive cavitation detection system to acoustically detect if the wind there's bubble clouds. And I found an almost exact correspondence between uh, a positive passive cavitation de detection signal and the appearance of this flickering black spot right at the transducer focus. Um, so this is kind of the basic physical mechanism for, I think, how a surgeon, when a surgeon is going to do histotripsy, he or she is going to want to see the actual thing that's causing damage. I think this is a good way, a good way to do it. Uh, you can also use MRI to, uh, to observe lesions. So you can think if you're emulsifying tissue and breaking down its structure, you're going to cause some kind of image contrast. So I, uh, I measure the T1 or T2 or uh, the reciprocal, 1 over T1, 1 over T2, and the diffusion coefficient of a whole bunch of different versions of these lesions made in a whole bunch of different tissues. And I found that in, in most tissues, uh, one of these three uh, uh, contrast parameters um, had some kind of dose response. So for example, in, in the liver, if you increase the amount of treatment that you give to, to different sections, you get different amounts of a change in your T2 coefficient, and the same with the diffusion coefficient. Um, 
What I did find, though, was that this was highly variable among different subjects. So liver, kidney, muscle, brain. Uh, RBC stands for red blood cell phantom. So that's uh, agar gel packed with red blood cells. And um, I thought, what, what's going on here? Why is it a tissue uh, selective response? Um, so that I then compared all of these lesions to different features in histology, uh, histology slides. And uh, what I found, and, and if I can interpret these correctly, or if I can explain it clearly, is um, if you plot the change in uh, the T2 contrast parameter in these tissues, or you plot the change in diffusion coefficient, and you uh, try to plot it against the region or, or how many um, red blood cells you find surviving in the uh, tissue, or you plot it with the number of remaining nuclei that have survived in the tissue, You've, what you find is that the change in your T2 contrast parameter, or 1 over T2, um, correlates really well with the number of surviving uh, red blood cells, and the, but, but doesn't correlate very well with the number of surviving nuclei. And then vice versa, the diffusion coefficient correlates really well with the number of surviving nuclei, but not very well with the number of surviving red blood cells. Um, and so what this told me in, from, in, from MR physics land is that the T2, um, the T2 coefficient, it's really responding to, um, uh, to the encapsulation of paramagnetic molecules, such as hemoglobin or ferritin. So in normal tissue, these paramagnetic molecules are packed into cells or into ferritin. Uh, and and uh, when histotripsy comes and breaks down the membranes that pack those things together and spreads the iron all throughout the lesion, you get this dramatic change in T2. Um, and then, uh, and red blood cells are a good surrogate for that. All right, but then uh, the diffusion coefficient is not very responsive to paramagnetic uh, uh, materials in the cells. And instead, it responds to the actual structures in the cell. That, uh, that impede the diffusion of water. Uh, and, and nuclei don't really affect uh, uh, the diffusion. I don't think they affect the diffusion of water in cells very well. But um, they are uh, kind of the strongest portions of the cell, the ones that are most resistant to erosion by histotripsy. And so they're kind of a surrogate. Uh, what I interpret this as is, is a surrogate for all of the kind of strong fibrous filaments within a cell that resist erosion and impede the diffusion of water. So as you continually erode these subcellular structures down, you get a continuous change in the measured diffusion coefficient. That was a long explanation for uh, one graph. But the, the main summation is that we were able to find uh, that image guidance could monitor the cavitation process, and then it can visualize the lesions. And what I hope I could show was that, that there's strong evidence that we could use MRI and image guidance to infer a subcellular or subvoxel response to erosion. Um, OK, so those are the two uh, examples. Let me just check the time. Uh, and now I'll talk. If there's any other qu uh, no questions, I'll, I'll move on to unmet needs and futures. But we have a question. You said subcellular. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Um, the cavitation events occur over a few hundred microseconds, so within a millisecond. But the, um, an M, the kind of electric waveforms that you play through uh, MRI scanner to capture information, one repetition is on the order of several milliseconds. Okay. I don't think I answered your question. Just, just keep going. I'll ask you after the Okay. Yes, I don't mean that we have subcellular resolution. Yeah. 
Right, yeah. So T1 and T2 and diffusion are sensitive to subcellular, uh, subvoxel particular, and, and then, yeah, uh, structures within the cell. And so if they change, perhaps we can infer, we can infer them from uh, the MRI contrast parameters. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right, so unmet needs in future directions. Okay, so uh, this is an engineering, uh, so that was some MRI physics. On the engineering side, um, uh, these procedures, these focus ultrasound procedures, uh, the, the MRI imaging is really, really terrible. So if you look in the papers, people try to show as, many, as few MRI images as possible. That's because they look really terrible. And, and a major reason why they look terrible is that you have this gigantic water bath. It's about seven liters that couple, acoustically couples the patient to this applicator. And that water bath causes all kinds of imaging problems. So you have uh, what's called aliasing or wraparound artifact. That's one of them. Uh, this kind of black bar is partially caused by what we call our pre-scan calibrations errors. So in other words, the MRI scanner has these automatic optimization algorithms. And uh, since this water signal is so big and bright, it's kind of optimizing imaging in the water bath and not in the patient. Uh, and then finally, we have, uh, it's a little dark, you, the water bath vibrates and you get these aliasing artifacts that are caused by motion. So I have a collaboration going on with Dr. Vlasaljevic uh, in the BEAM uh, Biomedical Engineering Department and then Dr. Rick Davis in the Chemical Engineering Department, both in Blacksburg. We've had, been fortunate to have some uh, foundation funding um, to try to fix this problem. And our hypothesis is, can we make some kind of acoustic coupling material that is physically present but invisible to the, uh, to the MRI scanner? And there actually is a perfect solution, and that is deuterium oxide, which is heavy water. So the hydrogen on water has an extra uh, uh, pro, uh, neutron attached to it, and that would be, uh, you would not see it on standard conventional MRI scanning uh, imaging. But the problem is deuterium oxide is really rare and really expensive. So that volume is seven liters, and one liter uh, commercially available deuterium oxide or heavy water is uh, $1,100. And uh, it's produced in nuclear power plants, so it's, it, it, you can't scale it, because if you have, say, 200 treatment sites across the country, you'll never have enough of it. So we have to find some other kind of solution. And our solution has been to use uh, iron oxide, so which are essentially rust. If we lightly dope this uh, water bath with iron oxide, then um, that little dis, uh, faint distribution of iron actually causes the signal, the MRI signal in the water bath, to decay really quickly. And its decay constant shortens from three seconds all the way down to five milliseconds, which is a fantastic development. And the sum total of the effect is this hemisphere is the uh, transducer, and it's full of water. And then we put in a, a quarter of a millimolar concentration and bam, the signal's gone. It's disappeared. Uh, so um, here's a kind of a replication of the experiment I saw before. Um, this is, here's the hemisphere of the transducer. I have this gel, except in this case, I'm continuously circulating the water. And so uh, you can see that there's a lot of, uh, instead of this uniform water, you have all these imaging artifacts and problems that are, that are uh, ongoing. Um, and then as I increase the concentration, those artifacts disappear. The water is still there and it's still circulating. It just doesn't have an effect on the image. It's invisible to the MRI scanner. Uh, we have some other uh, parts of this. Uh, what these two graphs are supposed to say is we have some other portions of this project. We have to make it acoustically compatible. Can we still transmit uh, ultrasound through the bath and achieve heating? And then uh, can we make sure that we're not inducing, that the uh, iron oxide nanoparticles are not seeding cavitation in the water bath itself? So they're not introducing extra bubbles that are cavitating and floating around in that, in that large chamber. Um, and so that's been, that's been a great collaboration. Um, another unmet uh, need is in uh, cavitation observation. So um, the physics of histotripsy is that when uh, your tensile pressure exceeds a given threshold. Uh, so if this is a map of pressure over distance, you get, uh, that's the region where you're, you're going to get cavitation. So uh, if you measure uh, 
this distance, and then you put in a hydro, uh, oh, what I should explain. This is a, a picture of what's called a red blood cell phantom, so red blood cells embedded in gel. And then we have treated it with histotripsy. And uh, the regions that are white are regions where the red blood cells have been liquefied by the bubble clouds, and light has been allowed to transmit into the camera lens. So if you measure the distance of the region that's treated, and then you stick in a hydrophone, and you measure the, the distance of the, acoustic, the, the, of the acoustic field that exceeds this cavitation threshold, you'll find that they correspond almost exactly. Um, but then acoustic beams have these things called grating lobes. They have these side lobes where the acoustic pressure can start approaching this threshold. And, uh, and so you can get sporadic cavitation that's off target. Um, that's why you get these little uh, white spots right here where bubble clouds have been emulsified. So um, if you're trying to do histotripsy in a, in a tumor in a child's brain, you, want to, you don't want it to have any kind of stray cavitation events, off-target cavitation events like I just described. Um, and so the surgeon is going to want to see every single cavitation event and to, and to see if this sort of effect has happened. So what we need is, is really accelerated cavitation imaging. So the, uh, the method that I showed you before, um, we were acquiring a signal from a cavitation event for every repetition of the MRI scanner. But MRI traditionally um, acquires image data in a piecewise manner, where it has to require image from multiple instances, and then it kind of averages them together. So the, the images that I was showing you had this black region that was from a cavitation, but it was actually kind of an average of many, many cavitation events. What we want to do is say, if there's a cavitation event, we get an image, and we get a measure of the intensity and the um, distribution of those bubble clouds. Um, so I, I actually did manage to do this in some ex vivo brains, but uh, I cheated. So this is some brain embedded in gel, and uh, here's the bubble cloud if we do that kind of average imaging. And if I play some, some tricks where I, I change the RF pulse design, what I can do is selectively excite just the small volume. And, and that reduces a 2D data sampling to a 1D data sampling problem. And that uh, much less data, I can greatly accelerate my imaging. Uh, but that's cheating. That's not necessarily a clinically viable way of, of, of monitoring these bubble clouds. So what I would like to do is to uh, leverage, do, do a trick in MRI called leveraging temporal redundancy. So if you notice from this image, um, from frame to frame, there's not a lot that changes. You have this flickering bubble cloud. You have electrical noise. Uh, you have some ghosting artifacts here on the sides. Um, there's some neat uh, mathematical tricks you can do where um, you can assume that the image changes. Very, most of the image does not change from frame to frame. Then you can undersample some of the, you can undersample the data you need to reconstruct the image, and then use this temporal redundancy constraint to basically guess the rest of it and get a pretty accurate response, a pretty accurate guess. Um, so that's a project I'd like to work on. Um, how are we doing? We'll do just a few more. So uh, another unmet need I'd like to do is is uh, lesion differentiation. So about. Uh, in the case of thermal therapy, about four hours after uh, a thermal ablation in the brain, um, the surgeon can see this very nice ring structure. Um, the innermost ring, and, and each of these rings corresponds to different, is hypothesized to correspond to different physical effects. The inner ring is hypothesized to correspond to thermal necrosis. Medium ring is, supposed, is hypothesized to correspond to cytotoxic edema. And so ring one and, and uh, ring two, uh, tissue is thought to die. And then the outer ring is hypothesized to uh, be caused by uh, edi uh, vasogenic edema. Um, and the thought is that neurons are, are sensitive to pressure. Um, so this vasogenic edema region, which is temporary, is still able to uh, turn off the neurons in that region. So if you're a surgeon and you're treating for some kind of effect, uh, say essential tremor, um, all of the neuron, initially all of the neurons in these three rings are going to, to turn off. Um, and, and so you're going to get a reduction in tremor. However, as this edema resolves, 
if there are neurons in the outer ring that contribute to the tremor, as the edema resolves, they may turn back on and you get a, re a return of your tremor. And so the surgeons really want to know intraoperatively what's the region of volume that's not just affected by the treatment, but that's actually going to stay dead, uh, stay, st uh, that's not going to turn back on. And this is difficult because intraoperatively, you can kind of still see those rings, but uh, hyperacutely, you know, uh, five minutes after an ablation, you don't get this three ring structure. You just get a white spot. Um, and then with histotripsy, there's, there's actually a similar problem, which is that when you treat the brain, you, you tend to uh, locally nearby those uh, bubble clouds, you, you break some blood vessels and you get some very local um, bleeding. If you emulsify a large volume, uh, the red blood cells infiltrate that volume and it looks like edema. If you have this sparse scattering of bubble clouds that only partially ablates the region but doesn't really liquefy it, you will still get extravasation of red blood cells into that volume. And so on MRI, they look the same. You know, you can see these uh, black spots and you could say, yes, I, I, I tried to treat them, I deposited acoustic energy, but is it liquefied or is it just petechial hemorrhage? They look about the same. Uh, so bleeding can mask the uh, erosional state in the brain. Um, where is the true homogenate? Uh, and I think a really nice solution would be uh, bulk properties such as diffusion MRI, MR elastography, or perfusion MRI. Um, I've done a little bit of work of this at, at UVA. So this is in pigs. So this is a pig brain. And I have ablated four locations in the brain. This is a T2 weighted image. Uh, you can see two of the lesions fairly well, but the other two are not, are not so well in the, uh, are not so visible in the T2 weighted MRI. This is uh, intraoperatively, so I've got the device hooked up to the brain, and within five minutes after uh, we've, we've done an ablation. But on the diffusion weighted MRI, we can see those four spots. Um, I think that diffusion uh, MRI elastography, diffusion MR, and perfusion MRI are going to yield a very rich information set on these lesions um, and provide uh, surgeons with information so they can make further decisions. Okay, so finally let's go to thermometry and why in the current implementations it's not very good and then I promise I'll, I'll be about done. So in, in the current implementation, if you're heating, uh, if you're using that uh, device to heat a, a treatment spot, your MRI scan is basically continuously acquiring just a single slice through that treatment spot. It has about a 3.5 second frame rate, and some of the uh, imaging parameters, such as the echo time, are not very well optimized to, uh, to, to uh, optimize the precision of your MRI estimate. So if you're continuously scanning a single plane, if, if, the, if the treatment spot is out of plane, you're, you're going to miss it. Um, and sometimes that can happen. If the skull heats, as the skull heats, its acoustic properties change, and the uh, transducer focus can rotate or somewhat shift or blur. Um, and so if your heating is out of plane, you, you completely miss it. Um, so what we'd like to do is to do a volumetric um, MRI. So we have some kind of, so we're acquiring an entire volume of, uh, of the treatment spot and getting thermometry data from it with a, a rapid frame rate and more optimized uh, MRI parameters. So I have a project um, currently funded by the Focus Ultrasound Foundation to use uh, what are called very long uh, spiral case-based trajectories. So that's uh, optimizing uh, the way that we sample the, um, uh, the image information. Uh, and you can really reduce the, the, um, the time it takes to, to uh, acquire a complete image data set. Um, and it can allow you to, to rapidly acquire a volume. The, the, the trade-off with using this technique, why it's not widely used, is that if there's um, fluctuations in the magnetic field, they can introduce blurring to your image. So uh, at UVA, I've been uh, working on some, I think, some really slick methods to remove this image blur. And combining this de-blurring technique that I've invented uh, at UVA with um, these long trade outs, uh, long readouts uh, or trajectories, I believe that we can get um, you know, a full volume uh, that covers the, the focal spot 
in about a two second frame rate with uh, pretty well optimized imaging uh, parameters. Okay, so in summation, in summation the future directions, uh, the MR invisible coupling baths, uh, real time, really fast 2D cavitation detection using MRI, um, using bulk properties such as diffusion, bulk moduli and perfusion to differentiate different features in the lesion. Uh, rapid 3D thermometry using these spiral trajectories. And, and that's all I have for this, for this list. Um, so that's where I'd like to go. All right, and just, uh, just to, to recap on why I think there's a lot of potential in this, future, uh, uh, in this space. <coughs> in the current clinical uh, implementation, fo focus ultrasound thalmomotomy for essential tremor, the patients are awake and responsive. And so if there's some kind of problem with the surgery, the patients can actually feel it. So if the, if, the focus, if the treatment focus is misplaced, sometimes patients feel a little bit of numbing on their, on their lips or their fingers, and they can tell the surgeon, and the surgeon can correct the surgery. It's, it's enormously helpful. Um, but in clinical trial and in development, there are a number of treatment conditions where this is not the case. The patients are either asleep during the procedure uh, or they're not so fortunate that the treatment tar target happens to be near neurons that, uh, that when they get destroyed, off-target neurons that when they are heated, they produce a sense, a sense that the patients can, re uh, a, a sort of sensory perception that the patients can then communicate to the, uh, to the surgeon. I guess what I'm trying to say is for a lot of these um, indications, if the surgeon's off target, the patients don't feel it and they can't report to the, to the surgeon. So you don't have that nice safety uh, cushion that we currently experience with thalmomotomy surgeries. Um, so in these, in these up and coming procedures, patient feedback is far less reliable and the therapy targets can be much closer to sensitive structures. And so imaging and MRI imaging feedback in particular is going to be even more critical to the patient. As, as Dr. Dr. Montague said, you don't want to mess up in the brain. Um, and so I, imaging, guidance imaging can help correct for the poten these potential problems. Okay, uh, and I just lastly want to say um, this kind of interventional surgery field is really awesome because it integrates all these different fields. So it's really fun. If you're interested in it, I can tell you more, tell you more about it. Um, I owe a big thank you to uh, my collaborators and funding sources. And thank you all very much for your time. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. what, what exactly is the need for that with the hisotripsy? Is there a, are you using oh, the hisotripsy right. or that factor? For yeah, I flip-flop between them, didn't I? Um, it's hypothesized, it, basically people assume that you don't need to do thermometry during hisotripsy because, it's, because the average duty, the duty cycle of your acoustic pulsing is very, very small. So the individual pulses have a lot of energy, but the time average is very small. So whatever energy you deposit is easily dissipated by the circulatory system. And there's no heat accumulation. So, so most people think you don't need to do thermometry during uh, hysteotripsy. I think in, in the case of clinical trials, you will still need to do it to demonstrate that there's no heating and to demonstrate safety, at least to get it through FDA approval. But the prediction, based on theory and certain amount of experimental work, is there really isn't. There, a, there isn't, a yeah. Right, okay. yeah, that's simply for thermal therapy. Is it an assumption? Yes, it is an assumption. It should be tested. Yeah, okay. and I, th I think it will be. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So you hit on something that's been bothering me for a while. When I, when I think about uh, focus ultrasound and ablation, mm -hmm. Image guided, but I put the guided in like triple quotes. Yeah. Um, because it's really almost behaviorally guided, and you were talking about responsiveness of the participant, mm -hmm. um, which is critical. But the nice thing about uh, heat and temperature ablation is that it can be done at sub threshold yes. sort of ablation. So you you can sonicate, but not in a destructive way. One in which you can make sure that you're actually. 
focus of the focus on energy in the appropriate spot. So with with hypsotropy, it seems like it's a one time event, and maybe you know the approach is tiny nibbles, mm -hmm. uh, but that still seems uh, you know. So it's, yeah. So so I guess the uh, right now, you know, with with state of the art, you know, what is the actual future for hypsotropy versus thermoablation, and you know, the image data part is critical. I think in both cases. Irreversible part of hypsotropy makes it harder. In my opinion. Yeah. Going back to your early discussion, do I want a knife or do I want something less than a knife? It's the mm -hmm. same thing as like, okay, do I want the surgeon to be able to, you know, test the waters first? Yeah. Uh, so anyway, if you could. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, no, that's that's a good idea. Um, so yes, a number of things. A big question with thermal ablations will be: Can we can we uh, be so accurate that we don't need to fall back on patient feedback? I think you're absolutely right on that. So all these up and coming clinical trials, I think, will live or die on that uh, if if they are sufficiently accurate without patient feedback. For the case of histotripsy, you're also right that there's no subablative bubble clouds. Every bubble cloud has the potential to cause damage. Um, and so there's some different ways you can try to get around that. If, if, you, can, um, if you have a transducer that can uh, cause a little bit of heating, you know, like you flip on one switch and you use an amplifier set that can deposit a continuous wave, acoustic waves, and generate a little bit of heating, maybe you can guess. The, uh, tr the heating from that. Um, you can limit your treatments to, uh, to volumes that you, you are certain that if your bubble cloud is off a little bit, you won't cause a lot of damage, uh, like the liver. Um, I have not presented on it because it's really preliminary, but I've been working on the math uh, for how to use the MRI scanner to actually measure the actual pressure distribution. Of, of, a, of a transducer. With no, actually with thermometry. So the idea is you have, to, you have to eliminate the effects of thermal perfusion and thermal diffusion and the uh, acoustic absorption coefficients. And then what's left is the acoustic power deposition. From there, you can guess the acoustic pressure. But it's, it's preliminary. I didn't want to present on it because I've, I've worked it out and I'm coding up a simulation for it. But I don't want to make promises on it. Um, I, I think that would be very valuable if it actually works. 